were discussing how to make an integrative using an op-amp. Uh, not just an op-amp, of course, to make an integrative you need some current to be flowing into a capacitor. What the, uh, what the uh, capacitor integrates is the current to give you a voltage, that is the integral of the current. So, you can have a current source uh, be which forces a current into a capacitor. So, in our case, we are, uh, we do not have current sources yet. So, we first, we use the trans impedance amplifier or a current control voltage source. In this case, the current control voltage source uh, proportionality constant is not frequency independent. It is set by a capacitor, so that you get the integral. So, from this current, to this voltage, from this current to this voltage, you have an integral relationship and we would like to have a voltage input. So, we convert the voltage to current using a resistor. Now, assuming that the op amp is operating in the high gain region of its operation, it has a large loop gain and with negative feedback and large loop gain, this uh, node is uh, forced to being 0 and uh, that is what gives you a current of V i by R which flows into the capacitor. Okay? So, V naught is V in minus V i by S C R. Now, what was the problem with this? Would it work as it is? What was the issue we discussed last time? Yeah, first of all, uh, the op amp has an offset, which makes it, which makes the output go unbounded even if you have an input and the value of this offset is uncertain. So, you can never really use this because even if you start off the op amp's output, uh, in the middle of the high gain region, it will quickly go out of it and hit saturation. Okay? So, this cannot be used as it is without some additional DC negative feedback and one way to introduce negative feedback is to connect a resistor R f. Okay? So, what is V naught by V i in this case? For the ideal integrator, it was minus 1 by S c r. So, please calculate V naught by V i for this case. V i by R. Okay. Only thing is it is going into both of these. The sum of these two currents is V i by R. So, that is all that you have to take care of. Okay. And if and I mean once you are sufficiently familiar with circuits, you can see that in place of an admittance 1 by S c, you now have the parallel combination 1 by S c plus sorry uh, 1 over S c plus 1 by R f. Okay? It is a parallel combination which means you have to add up the admittances. So, what you have to do? You will have instead of minus 1 by S c r minus 1 by R S c will get replaced with S c plus 1 by R f which gives you minus R f by So, does this behave like an integrator? What what kind of transfer function is this? What is the transfer function? What kind of a filter is that? Have you seen a transfer function like this? Yeah, where? Huh? Low pass filter, yeah. So, if you just have R and C, What is the transfer function from V naught to V i? What is V naught by V i? Sorry, V i V naught. What is V naught by V i here? 1 by 1 plus S c r. It is the same except of except that the D c gain is not 1. It can be larger than 1. Okay. Now, we started off with an integrator like yes. Now, we can consider V s. I mean, but we will see that at least unlike before, this will not make it unbounded. Okay? VOS will add an error, 
Okay. So, adding an error which is bounded is okay. Maybe then you can try to keep it within limits. But previously, however small VOS is, if you let it wait for certain time, it will always become unbounded. So, that is the problem. In this case, it will not be. Okay. So, now first of all, we started off with an integrator. I mean, is this an integrator or is it approximately an integrator? What the hell is this? How is this an integrator? So, let us consider the transfer functions ideal is and the real or real means the one that can work one that has a chance of working minus R f by R divided by 1 plus S e R. And how do you decide whether one is approximately equal to the other at least can one of them become approximately equal to the other when, when does it happen? If you see, this is has to be R f right ok yeah. So, when is that when yeah if in the frequency range or where omega c R f is much more than 1 it looks roughly like that ok. So, let us also look at the responses in time and frequency domains. First of all in the frequency domain what is the Bode plot of V naught by V i magnitude for the ideal case. Yeah, so it will have a single line. What is the slope? This is omega, right, on a log scale as usual. What is the slope of this? Minus 20 dB per decade. And what will be the phase of V naught by V i? No, no, of this one. What is it? Minus pi by 2 or pi by 2? Minus pi by 2. Why minus pi by 2? The 1 by s has a phase of minus pi by 2, but there is an additional minus sign. So, that adds like 180. So, this has pi by 2. Okay. Now, the real stuff. What is the magnitude of this? Oh, by the way, okay, let me get back to the ideal one. What is the frequency at which the magnitude becomes 0 dB or unity? 1 by 1 by R c. Okay. Now, let us go to the real transfer function that is including R f. What is the Bode plot, Bode magnitude plot? What will it look like? Constant? So, it will look something like this, it will have a constant. What is the constant equal to? R f by R okay. and it will fall off like that. Okay. Now, what is the frequency at which that crosses unity? The magnitude of this expression, what is the value of omega at which that crosses unity? 1. No, no, the magnitude is 1. What is the frequency at which it becomes 1? Huh? 1 by R c, why? Hmm? Yeah, calculate it quickly. I want to make the magnitude of this equal to 1. Okay. What is the value of omega? What? 1 by R f c square root of 1 minus. R f by R square minus 1. Does this sound right? Okay. So, let me take the R f by R outside. Okay. So, it becomes 1 by R c square root 1 minus R by R f square. Okay. So, is it uh, the earlier ideal case crossed unity at some frequency? Is this close to that or what is that? Is it similar? Is it very different? Hmm? Yeah. So, if R by R f is a small number, 
then uh, this will be close to that. And which anyway, I mean, just by looking at this, you had guessed that if RF is much more than R, this approximates. I mean, if RF is very large, CRF is very large, it approximates an integrator. Okay. So what will the Bode plot look like then? It will start from uh, RF by R. And what's the frequency of the breakpoint? What is the frequency at the so this this frequency, right? what is it 1 by r f times c and after that it in fact follows this line because it cross 1 by r c it crosses 1 by r c also at unit magnitude okay these bode plots are also quite useful in that if you know the slope many other things become apparent even if i had not calculated this even if we didn't calculate this expression you should be able to find it because this is 1 by r f c and the slope of this is minus 20 dB per decade. So, what does it mean? If I go up along the frequency axis by a certain factor, I will go down along the magnitude axis by the same factor, okay? is not it? So, here when I go from uh, R f by R to 1, it is a factor of R by R f and when I go from here to there, it will be the same factor. So, it will become the ratio of these two frequencies is the same as the ratio of magnitudes. That is the meaning of minus 20 dB per decade, right? Inverse proportionality to frequency. You understand? If you go up in frequency by a factor of 10, the magnitude will drop by a factor of 10. So, from that, knowing only a few break points, you can calculate other points quite easily. That is also the reason for using Bode plots. If it was minus 40 dB per decade, it means an inverse square dependence on frequency. So, there if you go down in uh, go up in frequency by a factor of 10, you would go down in magnitude by a factor of 100. Okay? So, from these things you can do a lot of calculations even with simple Bode plots. So, anyway we started off by saying we wanted an integrator and then we said hey it does not work. So, we have to add DC negative feedback and we added a resistor. Now, this kind of strategy may or may not always work because hey that does not work. So, I add some component I mean the new circuit may not behave like anything like the old circuit. right? That's possible, but in this case, at least it looks like, in some frequency range, it has a similar behavior, right? And what will be the phase? What is the phase of this? What is the phase of this expression? What is the phase at very low frequencies? Pi. Uh, and then, what is the phase at uh, very high frequencies? Pi by two. So. It starts from pi and then it goes to minus pi by 2. Okay. It starts from pi and goes to pi by 2 and again in some uh, range of frequencies, it has the same phase as the integrator. Okay. So, if you look at it in the frequency domain, it looks like there is some range of frequencies where this can approximate an integrator. right? So, that means that you have this as a black box, the ideal integrator, however you make it and you have the real integrator and you apply sinusoids. Uh, if you apply sinusoids in this frequency range to the right of that, the outputs of the two will be the same, that is the idea. right? Of course, it, the approximation breaks down if you go to lower frequencies. So, these Bode plots and all these things are tools that you use constantly. right? It is basically like learning algebra. You have to know this in order to learn circuits effectively. Okay? Now, we can also look at it in time domain. So, let us say you have the ideal one, which basically corresponds to 1 over C r integral d t okay? and the input is a unit step let us say. This is the input or I already have symbols for these. This is V i and this is V o, V i versus t. Right? What is the output going to be? V o. I mean just for simplicity, let me get rid of this minus sign which may be confusing. I mean you just have to invert the graphs that is all. So, 
what will be the output? Huh? Ramp. Okay. So the output will be a ramp, and what's the slope of the ramp? If the input is one volt, what is the slope of the output ramp? 1 by CR, what is the unit of the slope? Volts per second. Okay. Now, instead of the ideal integrator, I use this block. What will be the response in the time domain? You understand, I have a transfer function RF by R divided by 1 plus SC RF okay. and I apply a unit step to that. What is the output going to be? Hmm. What is it? What kind of filter did you say it was earlier? First order low pass filter. So, what is the step response of a first order low pass filter? We have done this like so many times, right, in the tutorial. What is the step response of a first order low pass filter? Huh? Exponential. Okay. So, it will look like this, right. It will be 0 up to t equal to 0, and after that, it does that and reaches steady state. Okay. What is the steady state value if I apply a 1 volt step? Really? Why? Why is the steady state value 1 volt? You understand the question? I apply a unit step to a block which has this transfer function. What is the steady state value? Huh? What is it? You substitute s equal to 0 and tell me what is it? R f by r. So, if you apply 1 volt, it will reach R f by r volts. What is R f by r? That is the DC gain, right? So, obviously, if you apply a unit step and wait long enough, what you get is the DC steady state response. So, you will get R f by r. Okay. Now, I want to put it on the same axis as this. Okay. You understand? I mean, I have plotted the step response of the ideal integrator and I want to plot this on that graph. Please do that correctly. You understand? This is the ramp, right? On the same plot, I want to plot the step response that is qualitatively indicated here. Okay. What does it look like? Exponential, but I mean I can draw exponentials in many ways, like this or like that, or which way does it look? Actually, it starts with the same slope. That's important. So it starts with the same slope, but the thing with the exponential is uh, the ramp has a constant slope throughout, whereas the exponential, the slope keeps on falling, and it flattens out. Okay, and it flattens out to R f by R. Okay. Now, again looking at this, does this look like an integrator at all? No, never. Initially, for short time intervals, it does look like an integrator. Okay. And in fact, you can also see the converse. For high frequencies, it looks like an integrator, and for short times, it looks like an integrator. Frequency and time are inversely related quantities, right? Okay. So, this does behave approximately like an integrator as long as you do not wait too long. If you wait too long, what happens is the rate of integration slows down okay, because of the presence of this resistor. But this resistor we need because it provides negative feedback around the op amp and at least lets you make some circuit, whereas the earlier circuit while theoretically it was perfect, it would not work at all. Okay. Now, uh, how did you figure out that the slope at the origin is the same just after t equal to 0? differentiate what? So, you knew that the step response of that is R f by R 1 minus exponential minus t by R f c okay. and by differentiating this you can find out. Now, is there some way by looking at the circuit you can tell what the slope is I mean whether the slopes are the same? Yeah, let me draw the circuits just a second. Ok. 
Okay. So, both start with 0 initial conditions. Now, what is the relationship between you apply a step to both of them? What is the relationship between the slope here and slope there just after the step is applied? Huh? Same, why? Yeah, the slope is related to some quantity, what is that? Some electrical quantity, what is it? Capacitor current, the capacitor current is basically the rate of change of the voltage across it and the output voltage is nothing but the capacitor voltage because this point is at 0. Okay. So, what happens is when you start off this is at 0, so how much is the current flowing through the resistor? 0. So, just after you apply the step these two circuits are exactly the same because although you have a resistor no current is flowing through that. So, here all the current goes through the capacitor and there also all of the current simply goes through the capacitor, but that is of course, momentarily. I mean the moment the output voltage changes some current starts flowing in the resistor and that is what changes the slope right and again if you look at the other RC circuit in gory detail that is what you will see also. Okay. If I apply a step what is the slope of this V o just after the step is applied? So, let us say the capacitor of course, is initially reset it has 0 voltage across it. What is the Huh? 0 why the slope of the output voltage 1 by R c why? I mean you may be mentally differentiated the equation that is not what I want by looking at the electrical quantities can you tell? The voltage here is the capacitor voltage. So, what is the slope of it? It is the current in the capacitor divided by the capacitance and how much is the current in the capacitor? just after yeah, when this is spec to 0 all of the input voltages across the resistor. So, you get V by R V i by R. So, V i by R divided by C that is the slope. Okay. So, again whatever you get algebraically you should relate it to what you get from the circuits then C. Okay. So, this does behave like an integrator of course, it is not for very long. So, if you start from a research state you can it approximately behaves like an integrator and it can be used in that way. Okay. So, for instance somehow let us say you have some arrangement y where once it reaches this value you reset it and then you apply another value of input and you can integrate it that way. Okay. It is an approximate integrator, but what it really is is a low pass filter okay. low pass filter with a very large DC gain. What is the DC gain of the integrator? What is the DC gain of the integrator? Huh? What is the DC gain of an integrator? infinite 1 over s right you just substitute s equal to 0 you get infinity. That is the same way of say, same as saying you apply a DC input to an integrator wait for it to reach steady state. When does it reach steady state? Never actually at t equal to infinity. So, at t equal to infinity the output would have reached infinity. So, the DC gain of an integrator is infinite. Now, we cannot realize infinite gain that is actually one of the difficulties even in making op amps and so on. So, at least we can settle for a large gain R f by R. Okay. So, an approximate integrator is where okay, it has a finite DC gain, but at least it is large. Okay. So, this does behave like an integrator. So, this I mean we started off with some block that you have built in the lab, but of course, the point was also to introduce all these things that first of all an open loop integrator you can you simply cannot make it. Okay. So, it is inherently unstable. What is the definition of stability that you know of linear systems? When is a linear system stable? Huh? No, no, I know, but how do you evaluate if I give you a linear system transfer function? Poles should be left half plane. Okay. So, there is the S plane imaginary part, real part, and they should be definitely in the left half plane. What happens if they are in the right half plane? What goes exponentially? Huh? The natural response, the natural response of the system will grow exponentially. What about if the poles are on the imaginary axis? They will be constant, they would not die out. So, for absolute stability you actually need the natural response to die out. What does it mean? The natural response is the response of the system by itself. I mean it has some nature and its natural response is that. 
and the force response is its response to whatever input you apply. Okay. You want a stable system's output to be the response to the input that you apply. Okay. Initially, it will have some natural response, you ignore it, but after steady state is reached, it should depend only on the input. Okay. And that will happen only if the poles are strictly in the left half plane, not, in, not even on the imaginary axis. Okay. Because then you may have to wait a long time, but the natural response will eventually die out and the output will consist only of the contributions from the input, the force response. Whereas, if it is on the imaginary axis, the natural response does not blow up, but does not die out either, it will remain constant. Now, that has its uses when you make an oscillator and so on, uh, that is what you want, you want a steady oscillation. And if it is in the right half line, it is quite bad and that it just blows up and in a real circuit what happens is every circuit block that you have will reach saturation because it, nothing can blow up infinitely, so it will reach saturation. Okay. Now, if you take an integrator, where is the pole? Is it in the left half line, right half line, on the imaginary axis? Huh? On the imaginary axis, it is at the origin actually and it is on the imaginary axis its natural response does not die out. That means, that if the integrator has some initial condition, it never dies out by itself, right? it holds the output forever if the uh, input is 0. So, that is the meaning of this. So, you really cannot make, uh, if you have an unstable transfer function, you really cannot make it in practice, because first of all, even in ideally, this output is not dying out and in uh, reality, because of some noise or some other input, it is very likely to become unbounded. Okay? So, that is about the integrator. Now, you made an oscillator in the lab, how did you make it? Effectively, the principle was this, you push a current into a capacitor okay, I naught, I C let us say and if I see, let us say it is some positive quantity. Then the voltage across the capacitor keeps building up and once it reaches some threshold, what you do is you switch the direction of I see. Okay, you make I see negative, then this will start falling and once it crosses another threshold, you switch again. Okay. So, this is effectively how your circuit worked. Right? You did not use a current source and a capacitor, but you use some circuit that does exactly the same thing. So, you had an integrator and the integrator was op operating with piecewise constant inputs. You apply some constant input, the output will keep on rising. Once it hits a threshold, you reverse the polarity of the input and it keeps on falling and so on. So, that is how the oscillator works. Now, to be able to do this, first of all, you need some what? Some comparator, something that compares, something that compares the uh, voltage with some other voltage. <coughs> Let me call this V t. So, you compare the capacitor voltage with V t that is you subtract the this one from there and then this comparator. So, let us say if this is greater than 0 the output will be high and less than 0 the output will be low. Okay. So, that is one of the, I mean that is a comparator. That means, that it has an analog input, a continuous uh, valued input, but if the input is more than 0, it gives you a high logic level or a high voltage, some voltage corresponding to high logic level and if it is less than 0 or equal to 0, let us say it gives a low logic level. Okay. So, very simple block, but how do you implement this? I mean do you know of any component that you can use for a comparator? The op amp. Yeah, the op amp is saturated, so you could use. Actually, this is not a great choice in that we have not looked at what is inside an op amp. Once we see all the internal details of the op amp, we see that what is good for making a nice stable op amp is not necessarily what is good for making a fast comparator. The comparator has to make the decision ideally instantly, right? The instant the output crosses 0, however small it is, it should give you a high level. So, that is not good for that actually but we will continue to use for now the saturating op amp as a comparator. Okay. So, you can use the op amp by itself as a comparator. So, let us assume that this is operating with supplies of V d d and minus V s s. 
So, it has characteristics like this right V d d minus V s s, this is V i and V o. This would be the characteristic of a comparator. Okay. Now, there is a general problem when you do any comparison I would say. Okay. So, clearly now let us say that the input V i does something like this, it is varying in some way. What should happen to the comparator output? In this part, the input is below 0. So, the output will be at minus V s s and the moment it crosses this, the output should be at plus V d d. Okay. So, it should switch instantly. Now, the general problem you have with this comparator or in general with many comparisons in any domain of life I would say that the input is never clean like this. Okay. So, you could have some uh, jittery input I mean not jittery some noisy input. Okay. So, that means that the input value at any point is affected by some random noise. So, what difficulty do you see with using the comparator here with a noisy input? What is that? Yeah, it could be that I mean when the ideal input value is very small, but positive the noise could take become make it become negative and then it becomes positive, but of course, once the input becomes very large the noise is not probably going to make it negative, but around the uh, threshold around 0 the noise can make it randomly positive or negative okay? and it is around 0 that is the crucial point. right? How hard is it to tell the absolute best from the absolute worst? It is very easy I mean that is why I said this is also true in every domain of life. Okay? To tell a genius from a donkey it is very easy. The problem is like how to uh, figure out people who lay a, be a, who are on the border line. Okay? Similarly, here quantities that are near the threshold that is what is hard to judge and noise can severely affect that. Okay? So, you have to decide what to do I mean if you let it be like this and the comparator is in fact instantaneously making decisions what happens is around this there will be a lot of chatter it will go uh, between minus 1 and plus 1 or a negative value and a positive value many times before settling. Okay? But let us say you do not want that kind of behavior, okay? you do not want that kind of jittery behavior. In general whenever you make a decision I mean this is what is indecision right you cannot make a decision you keep uh, thinking back and forth oh maybe I should do this maybe I should do that. So, that is not a good state for anything I mean including electronic systems. So, it may be you are better to make a firm decision even if there is some probability that it is wrong it is may not be the right decision, but just make a firm decision and move on. Okay? Now, how would you arrange for the comparator to do the same? Do what? Yeah. No, no, I mean there is one signal and one noise that noise may be the contributed by like so many different sources we do not care, we, but we just have one input to the comparator right. The comparator is just looking at this input, it is looking at the signal and noise in this input. The origin of the noise we do not care about right now, the noise could come from like 100 different components. Okay. Low pass filter what? <coughs> So, okay, you have some instinctive idea that the noise is at high frequencies, first of all that may not be true, but let us say that even that is true low pass filtering is not always a great idea, because one of the reasons to use comparison is to find out when it crosses 0. Okay. Whenever you pass a signal through a low pass filter it is true it will get rid of some of this wiggles, but also the timing of the 0 crossing may be different. Okay. So, it will come a little later there will be some delay in the low pass filter and so on. So, in such cases you cannot use that. And actually you may be you will never be able to separate out noise completely you may be getting rid of either some part of the signal or leaving behind noise. Okay. So, for now low pass filter is not my preferred solution. Now, in general what is it that you do? Okay, Let us say you you are just looking at a meter or some reading and then uh, whoever made the meter has like 3 decimal digits on it. Okay. But if you have are measuring some quantity which is changing rapidly the last 2 decimal digits are probably like varying very very rapidly and you really cannot even read that. 
but your uh, goal is to find out if the number goes beyond a certain value. What is it that you do? Huh? Repeat the observation, but you, if you are not even able to read that, what is what? Huh? Leave them out. That's what you do, right? I mean, you don't even look so finely. So, what is it that you do? I mean, let's say you are uh, somehow your eye is not able to discern whether uh, I don't know what it is. I mean, let me take some artificial problem. Maybe you are looking at some water level, and then you want to see whether it is above or below this. Okay, maybe it's in your hostel, and if it's below above your knee level, you run out. Otherwise, you stay in watch TV, right? So that you could do. So you are looking at it, but water the surface is not steady. It will keep rippling. Okay. So what would you do? I mean, you can't compare it to that exact level. So maybe you'll pick a level that is higher than that, and if something crosses that, you definitely say that you go out, right? That's that's basically what you do. You omit the the small things altogether, and you look for a higher threshold. Okay. And then, as it is falling down, what do you have to do? Huh? Yeah, you should probably pick a lower threshold. So that is, when you are looking for something crossing zero, maybe you don't even look at zero. You look at a little bit above zero. Okay. And then when you are going, when you are looking for crossing in the other direction, uh, you want to make sure that it has crossed. So you may, maybe you have a say, threshold that is a little bit below zero. Okay. And this happens. I mean, this you actually apply in many cases, like uh, whenever you are making decisions. Especially, let's say you have a voting system where you have exactly you make decisions based on 51 uh, percent majority. Then, like one guy like, is making his, uh, I mean, one indecisive guy can completely screw up your decision, right? Today the decision is this, tomorrow it's that. So many times you have, you need to have 60 percent majority. It's exactly this idea that uh, you want to have a firm decision. Now, if you want to switch the decision, like at least 10 people will have to go in the other way. Okay. So such a thing is known as hysteresis. That is. While looking for the positive zero crossing, you don't look at zero; you look a little bit above zero. And when you're looking for the negative one, you look a little bit below zero. Okay. So that means that I'm not looking at the sign of uh, vi. I'm looking at the sign of vi minus some, let's say vx. And also vx is chosen such that vx is positive for positive. Rising, I mean, uh, rising zero crossings, and Vx is negative when you are trying to detect falling zero crossings. Okay. Essentially, you introduce what is known as hysteresis. There is some lag. Actually, what you are doing is not right. Initially, I started off saying you may want to, you want to compare it to zero, but that's not what we are doing. We know that around zero there is so much noise. Essentially, you pick some Vx that is definitely going to be above the noise, so that if you look for the input greater than Vx. You know that with noise or without noise, the input was definitely above zero. Okay, that's the idea. Of course, you have to reverse the process when you are going in the other direction. You have to make sure that it is definitely negative. Okay, that's essentially what we are doing. And such a business, uh, such a thing is known as hysteresis. There is a systematic error here, but in the interest of making firm decisions, let's say we don't worry about it. Okay. So, how do we implement it in the circuit? I have my op amp. What is op amp comparing? If I use it as a comparator, let me say it is VDD and minus VDD. What is it comparing? Actually, it is comparing the voltage at uh, this terminal with the voltage at the other terminal. If I hook it up like this and connect VI there, so it is trying to compare it to 0, but then we have this problem. But I now I want to modify the circuit so that while looking for increasing V i crossing 0, I compare it with V x that is positive. Okay. And while going the other way, I look for V i being less than some other V x prime which is negative. Okay. How do I how do I go about doing this? Is there a way to do that? You understand? You look for the condition if V i is greater than V x, which itself is greater than 0. So, that is you do not look for V i rising above 0, but above some positive quantity and when it is falling, it is the other way around. Okay. How do you make the circuit like this?
Okay, I will give you a hint. When V i is rising, so that means that V i is initially negative and be, it becomes positive. Okay. So, now what is the value of V naught initially when V i is negative, what is the value of the output? It is 0, yeah, it is minus V d d. So, you can look at the output okay, and essentially what you do is, I mean I will even remove this plus and minus signs. You use the op amp to compare V i with some V x and this V x is not some fixed value, you actually make it dependent on the output, you understand. So, if you do that in the right direction, what will happen is you will get this hysteresis. Okay? So, since we are uh, out of time, I will show you one example of it. So, what you do is you make V x a fraction of this, this looks very much like the amplifier, but this is not the amplifier. So, first of all find the right signs not for negative feedback, but for this action okay? that is when it is rising in uh, the rise, uh, positive uh, direction, it should cross a positive value and when it is going in the negative direction, it should cross a negative value. Okay? on top of it. So, let us I mean I will still call this uh, maybe or maybe I will call this R 2 and R 1. So, then you plot V naught versus V i okay, and then see what happens. And the circuit that you have used in the lab is very similar to this. And if on the V L S I side you go to the course page for E 3703 there is a lecture which describes these things. This is what is known as a Schmidt trigger. It is a comparator with hysteresis. It is quite easy to draw the characteristics once you understand the principle. So, please do that. There are a couple of different types and the interesting thing is these look like you have miswired an amplifier. Okay? You take the inverting amplifier or the non inverting amplifier and you make some mistake in wiring, you seem to get this, but it is not a mistake. I mean this circuit is different and it behaves very, very differently from the amplifier. Okay. So, please think about these things and then uh, you will be able to better understand what circuit you had. Okay. Any questions about any of this?